Night has fallen, and the moon is a glowing golden orb in the black sky. See how it shines on the dark back roads of America, and on one road in particular. Come with us, and we'll take a walk down the moonlit road, for the night is waiting, and the moon is full. The Moonlit Road presents Episode 17, The Black Dog, written and told by Jim McCamus. Back during the 20s, folks in the South didn't have big department stores or malls to go buy the things they needed. At best, they had a general store nearby. Maybe a town with some larger stores, And, of course, there was always the mail-order catalogs. Another source of goods was the Roland store, usually a a good-sized truck loaded down with about everything you could imagine. They had come rolling into town and set up where folks could come and look and buy. It wasn't unusual for them to pull right up in your driveway and open up. Of course, in Kentucky, there were lots of coal mining company towns. If a Roland store passed through there, the company got their cut. You couldn't compete with the company store and not ante up something. Earl had a rolling store that he drove through deep rural Kentucky. He didn't make great money, and he missed his family. But on the open road, he was happy and free. It was getting on towards dark, and Earl was looking for a place to pull over and spend the night. Because you see, some of the rolling stores had a little compartment built in the back of the truck, Sort of a 1920s RV, a place where you could spend the night. And up ahead, he saw something in the road. Wasn't sure what it was at first. Then it turned and looked at him. Its eyes glowed in the headlights. It was a black dog. A big black dog. Looked more wolf than dog. Blacker than any dog he had ever seen. Earl eased to a stop, but the dog showed no sign of moving. Hey! He hollered out the window. Want to get run over? The dog just looked at him. He blew the horn. The dog never budged. Well, I'll be. When he stepped out of the truck, the dog got up and ambled on down the road. Now where are you going? Earl got back in the truck and started up. He couldn't pass the dog because the dog was walking right down the middle of the road. If you really wanted to call it a road... That was being benevolent. It was a lot more like a pig trail with ruts and a big ditch on either side. He couldn't just run over the dog. Up ahead there, he saw a nice flat place by the crossroads, plenty of room for the truck and a good stream running nearby. The dog went over and laid in the grass. Earl pulled over, got out, stretched a bit, and gathered some wood for a fire. He cooked a little supper and even offered to share with the dog. But the dog kept his distance. Just as the moon came up, the dog began to stir. He walked around and acted like he wanted Earl to come with him. And for some reason, Earl felt like he ought to go. He followed the dog down the moonlit road, and not too far away was a sharp right-hand curve. Just as they got there, the dog turned, looked at Earl, and leaped into the hillside. Just like that, he disappeared. Earl was dumbfounded. He just stood and stared for the longest. Finally, he went back to camp, but he didn't sleep well that night. The next morning, he went on his way. Now, this was company town country. The company would come in and build houses for the workers. In every town pretty much looked just like the others. Rows of cookie-cutter clapboard houses, oftentimes the only distinguishing feature being the color. Some folks used store-bought paint to paint their houses bright colors. Others used whitewash. Still others would mix a little color in the whitewash and use that, and some just left the houses unpainted. You never knew how good you'd do in a company town. A lot depended on the company and how much of a cut they took. Earl did fairly well that day, even with the company cut. 
It's getting on towards dark as he headed back towards the crossroads, and lo and behold, up there in front, in the road, was the dog, just standing in the middle of the road. It'd walk a few steps and turn to look at Earl. It wanted him to follow it. When the dog got to the turn in the road, it turned, looked at Earl, leaped into the hillside, disappeared again. Earl was thoroughly shaken, but he drove onto the crossroads to spend the night. He determined that he had hit the next town and then clear out of these parts. Life on the road could be strange enough without disappearing dogs. The next morning, pulling into town, he knew something was wrong. It seemed everybody in town was all dressed up, and it wasn't even Sunday. They were gathered around the yards and porches of several of the houses. The first house, Earl found out there had been a cave in at the coal mine. Shaft number three had caved in, trapping several miners. All of them were dead except for one that was still missing, most likely still buried under tons of coal and rock. Earl figured he wouldn't be selling anything during the funeral, so he headed out of town, almost relieved to be getting away. Slowly, he drove by house after house, sad-faced, black-frocked women sitting on the porch clutching pictures of loved ones, other women, relatives, and friends trying to comfort them, yards full of men, not saying much, just standing around uneasily, not really knowing what to do or say. As he was about to turn out of town, he saw something that made the hair on the back of his neck stand straight up. A picture. A big, burly coal miner, hard hat, and carbide lamp on his head, covered in coal dust. Only his eyes and toothy grin shone out of the blackness. Striking though he was, it was the other image that caused Earl to stop. A large, coal-black dog. More wolf than dog. The dog, or his twin. Earl started to get out of the truck, but the somber, unfriendly looks from the men in the yard made him figure it was time to go. As he drove out of town, he tried to think about where he'd go next, but he could not shake the picture from his mind. It had to be that dog. Then there, right there, out in front, it was the dog. And the dog looked straight at Earl, turned jumped into the hillside, disappeared third time. Earl could hardly wait to get back to the crossroads. In a big cloud of dust, he turned around and headed back down the road as fast as he dared. He had to go back and tell them what he had seen. Earl pulled up in front of the house where he had seen the picture. The women were still on the front porch. The men in their Sunday best fill in the front yard. From the porch, he could hear the women humming precious memories, keeping time with their rocking and their funeral fans. The men were in several clusters, most smoking cigarettes or pipes, shifting on one foot to the other uneasily, tugging at the unfamiliar tightness of a starched collar. Earl jumped out of his truck and started up the walk to the house, but a couple of grim-faced men stepped in front of him. You best be getting on down the road, peddler man. This ain't got nothing to do with you. Ain't nobody buying today. Earl ignored them. He leaned around him and said, Ma'am, I've got to talk to you. It's about that dog, the dog in that picture. What about the dog? growled the larger of the men. I've seen the dog. The woman stood up. You've seen Shuck? If that's his name, yes, ma'am. Absolute quiet. The strains of precious memories died in the air. All the men within earshot turned and looked. The men blocking his way took a couple of steps back. Peddler man, if this is some kind of joke, the woman said, let him be. What do you mean you saw the dog? He's lost in the mine with my husband, Jack. Shuck went down in the mine every day, just like a regular miner. Fact, Jack said he worked harder than some of the ones that went down there. He always said Shuck was good luck. Now speak your piece. Earl told them the entire story of the black dog he had seen on the road. The woman clutched the picture ever closer and closed her eyes to hold back the tears. Mister, I don't know what you saw or why you're here, but I think it's time you were getting along. You ain't helping. An ancient wrinkled man whose every pore seemed filled with coal dust stepped up and said, 
Y'all hear what this feller just told? Don't you realize where he's talking about? Wait a minute, another said. That's right there at the devil's mouth. What do you mean? What's the devil's mouth, asked Earl. The old man spoke. The company called it shaft number one. It was the richest coal vein and the biggest, deepest, blackest shaft anybody ever saw. Dug before any type of power drills or any other machinery. Dug by hand. Why, when you started down that shaft, seemed like it went on forever. Seemed like she wouldn't bottom out this side of perdition. So all folks around here took to calling her the devil's mouth. When the vein played out, they dynamited her shut and built the road right along there. I wonder if it still connects to number three. Suddenly, it seemed the yard was full of men, all talking at once. The old man stepped up on the porch. The barian's just going to have to wait. We've got work to do. Shuck showed the way, and Jack may just be in there. Alive or dead, we've got to get him out. The crowd evaporated only to reappear moments later in work clothes, carrying picks, shovels, drills, hard hats, and carbide lamps. Everybody piled into trucks and cars, and off they went. There at the devil's mouth, everybody piled out. They pitched in and started digging. They moved tons of earth in what seemed like minutes. On into the night they dug. Anxious women waiting at the edge of the light. Young'uns looking out from behind skirt tail. Miners working in shifts. Digging and shoring up the shaft they were making in the hillside. Reopening the devil's mouth. Finally, there came a shout. We've broke through! The crowd surged forward, looking and listening for any sign that they had found the lost miner. He's alive! The words flew like lightning through the crowd. He's alive! Oh, thank heaven, he's alive! They found Shuck, too, just a little bit away, crushed by a fallen timber. When Jack was carried out, he was exhausted and hungry, but aside from a broken leg, he would be okay. He spoke. When the trembling started, me and Shuck lit out, ran as fast as we could. I was hoping the shaft still connected and hoping I remembered how to get here. When that back end there fell in, Shuck got caught. My leg got broke. I crawled over to him, but he was gone. I've been sitting here three days, wondering if I'd ever see the light of day again. Been awful dark since my carbide run out. But you know, the strangest thing was that sometimes it felt like Shuck was right there by my side, nuzzling up to me just like always, keeping me company. He was a good dog. I'll miss him. Jack didn't know how good a dog he really was. For somehow, even in death, Shuck had come to his master's rescue. And that's the story of the black dog. That concludes this tale from The Moonlit Road. Be sure to visit our website at themoonlitroad.com to find out more about our stories and let us know how we're doing. The Moonlit Road is produced and directed by Craig Dominey, recorded and soundscaped by Henry Howard in beautiful Stone Mountain, Georgia. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>